Hi guys. <laughs> Thanks for uh, checking in. So this brings us to lesson 10 two in your textbook, which is the lesson that's called real numbers. And it, as it turns out, this is actually going to be the last lesson in our unit that we've been working on for a few weeks. The unit that we've been studying is called uh, real numbers and exponents. And if you think way back to when we started working with this unit, we started with a lesson in chapter three. I think it was lesson three too. And uh, I think that was also called real numbers or I think it was called rational numbers. And we're gonna be talking about rational numbers again today and we're gonna be talking about irrational numbers today. So some of this might sound familiar, but I have two little words of caution for you. First of all, um, I have a feeling that this is going to be a bit of a lengthy lesson. I'm going to guess it's going to be over 15 minutes, so get comfortable. This might just take me a while to get through. And my second uh, word of caution would be when we get near the end of the lesson, and I'll tell you when, we're going to be seeing some equation type problems involving exponents and square rooting and such. And you're really going to need to pay attention to that very last slide of examples where we're solving for a variable because that is definitely new learning, okay? So we are ending the lesson with, uh, or ending the unit with a lesson called real numbers. And like I said, this is going to seem maybe somewhat familiar from the, ver the way that we began this unit. Okay, so if you remember back to when this all started, the very first lesson we did in this unit was, I, like I said, I think it was 3-2. And I was showing you how to take numbers like 5 or 0 0.12 or 0 0.05 repeating or 2 and 1 fourth or 1.7. And I was showing you how to take all those different kinds of numbers and write them as fractions. And when you can do that, when you can take a number and, and write it in a fraction form, you are proving that it is a rational number, okay? And, and I'll show you a, a graphic here in just a minute that'll look familiar. On the other hand, if you have a number that cannot be written as a fraction, then you have what's called an irrational number. And irrational numbers are, for the most part, decimals that never end and never ever have a repeating pattern. And as you can see here on this screen, in red it says pi is an irrational number. It's probably the most famous irrational number. A lot of kids know uh, about pi. We use it when we're working and doing calculations with circles. And kids, even young kids in elementary school can probably tell you that pi is cool because it never ends and it never repeats. And because of that, it can never be turned into a fraction. And that's what makes it irrational. So when we take these irrational, crazy, never-ending, never-repeating decimal numbers, and we also take all of the other numbers that are rational, right, the ones that you can write as a fraction, and you lump them all together, you get the whole set of numbers that are called real numbers. So real numbers is everything you see here. It's the irrational guys the, over here on the, on the right-hand side, that's kind of blurry and hard to read. And it's everybody else on the left-hand side, the rationals, the integers, the whole numbers. Everybody all together, all numbers put together that we're going to be working with for the remainder of the school year are called real numbers. They're not imaginary numbers, they're real numbers. Let me give you some examples of these numbers again, just for a reminder. Whole numbers would be like 0 and 4 and 10 and 21 or 99, whatever, okay? We work our way out into the integers. We simply bring in the negative sign. So we're talking about negative 2. We're talking about negative 45. We're talking about negative 107. How about this guy? Negative the square root of 25, right? What's the square root of 25? 5. And what's the negative of that? Negative 5. So negative the square root of 25 is basically like a problem that has to be solved and when you solve it you get the answer of negative 5 and that is an integer. Out here talking about rational numbers, now we're talking about things like decimals and fractions and mixed numbers. How about a repeating decimal? Remember those? There's a fraction, one-fourth. 
that 1.7 or 1 and 7 tenths, that could be turned into a fraction. Even things like negative mixed numbers, those are rational numbers because I could turn that into a fraction. So rationals and integers and whole numbers, that's part of what we call real numbers. And then we have these crazy wackadoo irrationals. Again, the most famous one is pi. Uh, another uh, example would be uh, take the square root of 5 on your calculator. Or how about something like this, 0 0.13141182, blah, 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 right? Never ending, never repeating. That's an irrational number. So I'm going to make a little note here. Irrationals never end and never repeat. That's what makes them irrational. Put them all together, real numbers. Okay, well what are we actually going to be doing today? Let's take a look. First thing we're going to do is we're going to see if you can identify all sets to which these numbers would belong. Your choices are whole number, integer, rational, or irrational. You have to name everything that it is. So I'm looking at 21 over 7. Can that be simplified down? You bet. 21 over 7 really means 21 divided by 7, and the answer to that then is 3. Okay, so you're looking at 3, and now you're going to name it everything it is. Well, it's a whole number. It's an integer, because the whole number bubble is inside the integer bubble. And it is rational, because it is inside the rational box. Right? And we can express it as a fraction. In fact, we already did. It is not irrational. Right? If you're irrational, that's all you are. You're nothing else. How about negative 2.5? Well, it's not a whole number. And it's not an integer because integers can't have decimals. That means it is just rational. I can express that as a fraction. How about 0 0.2 repeating? Well, my goodness, I think that was one of our examples back on the previous slide, right? Do you remember how to turn that into a fraction? Remember that? 2 over 9. So, it's rational. Nothing else. How about the square root of 36? What is the square root of 36? It's 6. So, what is 6? It's a whole number. It's an integer. It's rational. But it is not irrational. How about the square root of 38? I want you to punch that in your calculator and tell me what you come up with. Well, I guess you don't have to tell me, right? Because then you'd be talking to your computer. That might be weird. Why don't you write down what you get when you type in square root of 38? You're just going to wait for me to write it. I suppose that's true. 6.16. Four, four, one, four, zero, zero, never stops, never repeats, never ends, blah, 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 crazy, wackadoo. What's that make it? Irrational. So you'll have some problems in class where you have to try to identify all the sets to which numbers belong. Okay? Fantastic. What's next? Ooh, comparing and ordering rational and irrational numbers. Well, isn't this interesting? Greater than, less than, or equal to, you need a calculator. Holy cow, it's hard for me, a seasoned math teacher, to be able to compare these numbers the way that they're written because they are not being displayed or expressed in the same format. My suggestion to you is to write them in their decimal forms. So if you're looking at 7 and 2 fifths, this guy right here, how do I write that as a decimal? Well, I know it's going to be 7 point something, but 7 point what? How do you take 2 fifths and turn it into a decimal? 2 divide by 5. And that gives you 0 0.4. So it's actually 
Fractions mean divide, right? So if you're given a fraction, numerator, divide by denominator, and that will turn it into a decimal for you. Now, we're going to compare that to the square root of 57. That's easy. Punch square root of 57 in your calculator, you're going to get this. Well, actually, I think I kind of I think it actually goes on and on, but I wrapped it up right about there. And now you can compare. 7.4 is what compared to 7.549? Uh, less than. See how much easier that is when they're written in the same uh, format, when they're expressed in the same terms? All right, so let's look at the next one. The square root of 6, that's calculator work. Square root of 6 is 2.449, give or take. I may have rounded that a little bit. Is what compared to 2 and 3 eighths? Well, 2 and 3 eighths is 2 point something. 2 point what? 3, oops, I just rewrote the fraction. How about 3 divided by 8? Oh, Miss Glessner, 0 0.375. So that's what goes on the 2. 2.375. So if you were going to be comparing this, 2.4 compared to 2.3, greater than. So when you see problems like this, get everybody in the same format, and the format I highly recommend is the decimal version. Fair enough. A little bit more practice with this. Yay! <laughs> now we have to put all these guys in order from least to greatest. Oh boy, who's the smallest? Hmm, hard telling because nobody looks like they're easy to work with at this point except maybe 8.333, right? We like that guy. Let's do some converting. 8 and 4 fifths. 4 divided by 5. becomes 8.8. .8. Square root of 64, calculators, that's 8. Nothing to do to this guy. We like him. He's ready to go. How about square root of 76, calculator? Yay! Now my brain says, oh, this is so much better, right? Now I can put these in order from least to greatest. Which one is the least? Eight is the least. Then who? 8.333. Then who? 8. And greatest? Guess what? I don't really mind if you do what I did, if you write them all in their converted forms. However, probably the better way would be to write them as they were originally written. For example, 8 was not originally written as 8. It was actually originally written as a square root of 64. 8.333 was written that way. 8.71779 was the square root of 76. And 8.8 .8 was originally eight and four fifths. That's probably the better way. Okay. But you know, if you write them in decimals, it's okay too. Okay. I warned you at the beginning of this uh, lesson that the very last slide, you were really going to need to pay extra close attention to because it suddenly now we're going to start solving equations that have exponents in them. Solve each equation round to the nearest 10th as needed. So if we have to round, we have to round. Look at this very first question. A to the second power equals 36. Now, some of you probably already know the answer. You probably already know what number squared gives you an answer of 36. You, it's 6, right? You know that. Let me show you how this works in math. If you are ever working in an equation and you work your way down to this point where you have one last step, the variable is being raised to the second power, and then it's equal to some number, and you need to undo that. You need to do the opposite in order to undo that squaring. The opposite of squaring a number is finding the square root of it. So if I want to find out what number squared equals 36, I'm going to take the square root of it, 
and the square root of this. The square root of a squared is a. And the square root of 36 is 6. And that's the answer. So, you know, mathematically, really all I did was find the square root of 36. You don't really have to write the square root of a squared part. If you just write a equals the square root of 36 like this, as long as you remember to take that little exponent of 2 that we had, you take that guy away, I'll be happy. And then the final answer is 6. And you go back and you check it. Does that make sense? If a is 6 to the second power, would that be 36? Of course it would. That's right. Okay, look at the next one. This one has another step to it. 2n squared equals 170. Getting rid of the exponent is the last thing you do. So that little exponent of 2, we're going to get rid of him last. The big 2 that's being multiplied by the n, that guy right there, he's got to go first. So instead of 2 times n, you do the opposite, and you're going to divide both sides by 2. Here, there, that guy goes away. I still have n squared. I haven't got rid of that yet. And over here, now I have an 85. Do you remember how to get rid of that exponent of 2? You take the square root of it, square root of that, and then you have to take the square root of the other side. Oops, if I could write an 8. There we go. So the square root of n squared is n, and the square root of 85, when you round it, is 9.2. Look at the next one. Why is the variable on the other side? I don't know. That's just how they wrote the problem. Who really cares? It doesn't matter. We're still trying to solve for d. Break the 3 off of the d first, right? Divide by 3 here and there. Divide by 3. So now I have 121 equals d to the second power. I haven't undone that yet. How do you undo the squaring of a number. You take the square root of it. And you have to take the square root of the other side, right? You have to be fair. You have, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And whoop, over this way, the square root of 121 is 11, and the square root of d squared is d. d is 11. Didn't have to round that one. Last one. Some number to the second power equals 30. How do I get rid of that exponent of 2? How do I undo squaring a number? You take the square root of it. And then you take the square root of this guy. Fair is fair. The square root of y squared is y. And the square root of 30, when you round it, is 5.5. Yay, disco! I think I got this done in under 20 minutes told you that would be a longer lesson than we've had in a while. So I apologize for that, but I think it's all worth it. Hopefully you did some good learning today. This is what we're going to work on in class, and if you use your time wisely, you should be able to get these problems done in class without any problems. All right, I'll see you then.